You probably know that already. <clears throat> Colgate tomorrow at home. Anyways, right now an Empire Innovation Professor at the Nanoscience and Inter uh, in Nanobioscience uh, and Interim VP for Research in the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering at SUNY Polytechnic. He's got active research interest in the in the uh, acquirement of novel biosensor technologies and biology inspired nanoelectronics, including novel hardware. Also, the executive director of the SUNY Applied Materials Research Institute that happens to fund collaborative research efforts between SUNY faculty and its industry partner, Applied Materials. And this afternoon, he's going to treat us to a, a something that could be very well massively groundbreaking, uh, rapid and accurate Lyme disease diagnosis using a plasmonic biosensing platform. So Dr. Katie, this platform is now yours. Let's welcome Dr. Nathaniel Katie, please. Thanks for the introduction. And if, if you're an astute monitor of the uh, the pamphlet for this uh, <laughs> session, you'll notice that my title's changed a little bit. And so that, that was about August 1st, uh, the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, which I was originally part of, uh, became part of University of Albany again. So we were about an 11-year hiatus. We were part of SUNY Polytechnic, and we're now back with UAlbany. So hence the purple slides. If you're a SUNY person, uh, UAlbany's purple. Any Great Danes out there? Okay, all right, one woohoo. Uh, <clears throat> and so, and, and I went from being an interim vice president of research to associate dean for research. So I don't know if that's a demotion, lateral movement, or what it was, but it's all good. So the okay. Ah, okay. So I'm at sort of a unique place. So just for full disclosure, I'm a microbiologist by background. My PhD is in microbiology. I spent most of my time uh, at Cornell during my PhD working on lab on a chip devices, uh, biosensors uh, for various pathogens, uh, mainly for listeria at the time. Uh, but I've always done sort of a hybrid of work between technology, engineering, and biology. And so it's, it's not surprising I ended up at a place like uh, what was used to be SUNY Polytechnic is now uh, you Albany again, uh, but the College of Nanotechnology Science and Engineering. We're we're a really unique hybrid site in Albany, New York. Uh, we're at this place called the Albany Nanotech Complex, and if you've driven by, so where uh, 87 and 90 intersect in Albany, you would have seen all of these white buildings, uh, and and that's that's you'll now you know what they are. That's the the home of uh, CNSC. Uh, and another entity called New York Creates. And so what New York Creates does is they really focus on the industry partnerships. They run the facility, which has anybody heard of a, a fab or a fabrication facility? And if you're local to this area, you've heard of Micron, right? And what, what they'll be building here. So we're, we're sort of the R&D version of what Micron's trying to build uh, in this area. Uh, so we're a chip manufacturing facility uh, where uh, companies and academics like myself uh, can do research and development development at the pre-production stage. So all the microchips out there, the memory chips, uh, biosensors like I work on, uh, can be fabricated and manufactured in this facility and then used for experimental work. So we don't really make any final products, but we're able to make all kinds of cool widgets uh, to test for uh, things like I'll tell you about. Okay, so the, the base technique that is underlying all of the, the research I'll tell you about in the next few slides is, is something called plasmonics. And so plasmonics is sort of this, this funny area. And so basically the, the idea of plasmonics is if, if you shoot light at a metal surface, you can actually excite electrons in that metal to oscillate and actually move around sort of like a wave. And so you have to have just the right combination of, of the angle at which you shoot the light at the surface, the wavelength of that light, what that metal film looks like, uh, a few other factors as well. Um, but basically, you can get uh, this, this metal surface to produce this really kind of cool wave of electrons. Why would you care? Uh, most people don't. That's not very useful for most of you. Uh, if, you're, if you've worked in a, a, a lab um, or utilized results um, to look at things like antibody binding kinetics or other types of binding kinetics, you may have heard of surface plasmon resonance or SPR. So there's these BIA core systems that, that a lot of folks have to basically look at, at binding events. And that's that's done at one of these plasmonic surfaces. We, we work with a company uh, called Ciencia that has pioneered a, a different approach of using plasmonics. So rather than using some of the other standard approaches to, to build a plasmonic surface, they build these grading-like structures. So in that cartoon, you'll see kind of a wavy uh, image of, of what should look like gold on a gray surface. 
And so that's a grading. And if you remember physics uh, back in the day, uh, you know, like gradings can do things like produce diffraction patterns or use for a lot of different uh, applications. In this case, the grading is, is the way that we get light to, to efficiently couple to the surface and form that uh, wave of electrons, that plasmon on the surface. And so we, we take this a step further actually. And when we get just the right combination of light interacting with the surface to create a plasmon, and what this is, what's shown here in the, that image I just clicked to uh, is a gold coated chip that we produce in our facility. Uh, and then the next image shows uh, a laser light being shined on that chip and you see a really kind of bright glow from the chip itself. Uh, so that's generating that plasmon. And then, oops, too clicky here with the clicker. Uh, what we can do is if we get a fluorescent molecule, so many of you might have used a fluorescent tag or, or used a test that used some sort of fluorescence. Uh, when we get a fluorescent molecule close to that plasmon, we can actually greatly magnify the intensity of the fluorescent signal that we get from that surface. So what's shown down here in that bottom image is if we have a flat metal surface and we put molecules on that surface that are have a fluorescent tag, uh, we don't get much of a signal at all. And if we have those molecules near one of these grating surfaces where we have this plasmon effect, we get really bright spots. And so at the end of the day, if you don't take anything else home from this talk, what we're doing is we're basically making microarray type of technologies to look at lots of different interactions at once. So for Lyme and, and what I'll tell you about COVID diagnostics, uh, we can look at lots of different antibody interactions in this microarray format. So from a, a Lyme diagnostic perspective, we're doing sort of what you would do with a Western blot or a Lyme blot on these types of microchips. Uh, and what we get is a more sensitive result. So we get much brighter signal for the same amount of target that we're capturing uh, with these with, as compared to other types of tests. Okay. So when we when we use these chips for biosensing, uh, the bottom is if you can see it uh, is it one of these gold chips. There's lots of little spots on it. That's our microarray. That's lots of little spots of protein that we've put on the chip. And then up top is one of a spotting instrument. So in our research environment, we can choose whatever protein or whatever uh, molecule we want to spot onto the surface to make our arrays. Uh, in a future product someday that might be a, an actual diagnostic, you would pre-populate a chip with that. But from a research standpoint, uh, we can it's a playground. We can put whatever we want on the surface of these chips. And the next is uh, just an illustration of what happens with our images. So the, the yellow wavy surface is our grating. We shoot light at it at just the right angle and we tag uh, our molecules with a, an antibody with a fluorescent tag and we get this really bright signal uh, out of that. And I'll show you uh, slides coming up where this is uh, uh, happening in, in, for, for both COVID sensing and also uh, what we've done in Lyme. Okay, so this is sort of a funny story. I didn't know how to put together the presentation. We actually were doing work on Lyme diagnostics before COVID came around and we had just done enough work to actually publish our first paper in that arena. And I know some folks from the audience, I, I think I spoke well before we even published that paper about the very initial work we were doing on using this plasmonic approach for doing any type of diagnostic in Lyme. Uh, so I'm gonna start in the middle of the story actually, where we were had, had kind of done that preliminary work in Lyme uh, and then quickly pivoted as soon as COVID came out. And we realized we, we hadn't made a, a good diagnostic for the disease itself, but in the Lyme work, we had developed an antibody test. And so we said, well, one of the early things we can do with COVID is we can look for COVID antibodies. Uh, and we can do that for a variety of different targets from the COVID-19 um, virus. And then eventually what I'll show you is we also could look at monitoring uh, progression uh, after vaccination. So looking at the, the immunological response after vaccination. And so we there's a lot of lessons learned from this work that we then translated back to Lyme. So we're, we're kind of mid-story. So here's the... Uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, what we focused on for developing a test was saying, which of these, and I'm used to using a pointer here, um, which of these different uh, potential antigens from the virus can we basically print onto some of our chips to make it a good test for looking for antibodies against different, different components of the virus? So we initially chose uh, either a partial uh, a piece of the spike protein, uh, nearly full-length spike protein, something called the receptor, receptor binding domain or RBD, which is the business end of the spike protein that grabs onto ACE2 receptors uh, during uh, infection. And then uh, we also ended up looking at a lot of different spike variants and then also an internal protein called the nucleocapsid protein. 
And so just to illustrate the way we, we do this and what the approach is, we, if this is one of our chips, and I don't know how well you can see the bottom of the screen here, but this is uh, one of our, our plasmonic chips. We can print antigens directly onto that. So we can purchase, and, and at the time, um, uh, the COVID was really kicking off. There were several companies that were just, I mean, every new variant that came out, they'd be producing purified protein uh, for, for different components of that, of that COVID variant. Uh, so we had a, a readily available source of antigens to purchase and then print onto these chips. We also print a variety of controls. So we could put a uh, human antibody or IgG onto the chip as well as a positive control, and then uh, a, a variety of different negative controls. So if, if we get a sample, uh, usually we've, we've been collecting serum or plasma. And then as you'll see later, we, we've done some of our own dried blood splot collection. Uh, we take that sample, apply it to the chip, if there are antibodies in that sample that bind the targets, that's what that little black uh, antibody is, is shown here. We can then come in with a secondary label and then that has a fluorescent molecule on it. So this is a little floor tag, secondary antibody uh, that we can use to then make this sandwich and then determine if we actually had uh, an interaction between the patient sample and the, the, the particular target antigen. And the controls are sort of important. We need to make sure that this, the test works. So that's why we, we immobilize uh, human antibody as a, as a positive control. And then as a negative control, we had really struggled during our initial Lyme uh, testing when we, were, when we were first doing this for Lyme with what is a good negative control that's consistently negative in all the samples. We played with uh, a variety of different proteins, including uh, bovine serum albumin, which is a really common blocking agent for those of you who do assay development, uh, but had issues with that. Uh, and so what we ended up using in uh, for, for the COVID work was human serum albumin. So it's a blood component from human uh, from human blood, obviously, uh, that were, has worked very well as a neg negative control. And we were eventually able to translate over to, uh, to the uh, Lyme uh, diagnostic work uh, uh, based on some of the work we had did with COVID. So we, we collect samples in a variety of ways. And, and early on in COVID, we, as an academic institution, not partnered with a med school and kind of having some loose collaborations with hospitals, did not have a, a, a reliable source of serum samples uh, that had been collected and characterized for us to use for testing. We got a few here and there, but we did not have a, a large uh, population of samples to work with. So, so while we, we did use serum initially in a, in a lot of the characterization uh, from what we could get, we needed a better method to, to do sample collection. So we... We looked at the literature and said, you know, what are some other ways that we could do uh, an easier sample collection that still might work for a, a serological test? So we, we found a lot of literature showing that dry blood spots were actually a viable way of collecting a blood sample and retaining antibody functionality. And then, you know, you could store them on the shelf, you can put them in the, the freezer. Uh, and whenever you're ready to actually run a sample, you punch out a little piece of uh, that dried blood spot from a paper card. Uh, you rehydrate it into some uh, buffer or solution, and then you can use that now as your sample. So for this, this initial COVID work, we said, let's, let's see if this is a viable way of actually uh, doing broader sample collection. Uh, we convinced our IRB that this was uh, something that would be relatively painless and easy to do to send folks out a little collection kit. Uh, so we had the dry blood spot card, a uh, couple of lancets, because people always seem to screw up the first time, uh, some band-aids, and, and uh, that was that's about it, and, and a return envelope with stamps. So we ended up collecting, I think, over the course of a few years, probably three or 400 samples this way uh, that we were able to then uh, to use for the, the COVID uh, assay development, and then later, as I'll show you, some of the, the um, response to vaccination studies that we did. So when we, we printed these chips and made these chips for doing uh, the, the COVID diagnostic, we had a, a variety of proteins that I showed you in the earlier slides, so some of the spike variants. Early on, we, we threw some other uh, antigens on there as well. We, we actually picked flu because we thought it'd be kind of interesting to see we kind of expected that people were either vaccinated or had been exposed to the flu. So this would be kind of a good potential positive control as well uh, from the samples. But our big challenge was, you know, how do we distinguish what's a, a good positive signal from background uh, and, and it could be able to consistently make a measure of that. So we decided to do a ratio metric test. And so what we did was we basically averaged uh, so we had a minimum of three spots for each target antigen. We took an average intensity for those spots and then divided that by the average intensity of our negative control, which is human serum albumin, 
but we wanted a little bit of a safety factor built in there. So when we looked at the negative control spots, we actually added three sigma or three standard deviations of that of the variation for that signal uh, to give us a little bit of wiggle room. So that became something we later called our GS, GCFP or, or fluorescent plasmonic uh, detection ratio. And so most of the rest of the slides, that's the, the number that we're looking at for whether or not uh, a particular target is lighting up well, that we're actually getting good binding of uh, antibody from the sample uh, to that target. So these are sort of data intensive slides. So I'll walk through them to, to just give a, a brief overview. But what we did first was we looked at both serum and dried blood spots as potential candidates for being able to discriminate uh, those who were had previously had a, a proven uh, COVID-19 infection uh, versus those who were uh, just healthy controls. And so with, with serum, um, it, was, it was pretty easy to tell, you know, which samples were uh, COVID positive versus not, uh, just looking at the data. For dried blood spots, there was a little more overlap between those samples, uh, uh, but we were able to, to start to, to come up with, uh, um, as I'll show you in the next few slides, uh, a way to do thresholding to figure out what was an actual positive result for those. We, and I should step back here. We also compared our tests uh, to two sort of gold standard methods. We compared it to an ELISA-based um, uh, assay for COVID antibodies. And then also the, the MIA uh, graph at the bottom is, is a Luminex-based assay. So it's a microsphere immunoassay for COVID-19 antibodies. And so we found that we compared our method uh, after, after determining cutoffs was that we correlated very well with both ELISA and with uh, the Luminex type of microsphere assay for being able to, to determine whether someone had actually uh, had COVID or not based on antibody profiles. So this is cool. You know, we're basically replicating what was what was possible with other methods. The interesting part is that our test uh, only takes about 30 minutes. So when you run a sample through one of these chips and then wash and label with a labeling reagent, uh, total time from beginning to end to actually having a result is 30 minutes. So it's a faster test. Uh, and as I'll show you later, we think we get better sensitivity for a, a variety of different targets uh, using this approach. So potential for higher throughput or faster throughput for, for getting results. So yeah, this is my little question here in that, that blue box is how do we actually find these thresholds to determine whether a signal is actually from a, an, a positive case versus a negative case? This may be boring. I don't know how many of you folks care about receiver operator characteristic statistics, but um, I thought it was interesting as we were doing this work, we needed a, to find a way to do thresholding. In, in other types of sensing that people do, they actually use this, this three sigma threshold. So if you're, if you're above three standard deviations above a background signal or a negative control signal, you can sometimes call that a positive signal. We, we wanted to be a little more robust. So we looked into the literature for how to, um, how to determine good thresholds um, in a, a more statistically relevant or uh, significant manner. And we, we stumbled upon receiver operator characteristics, which some of you may know about from clinical studies. This is used sometimes to look at the sensitivity and specificity of a particular technique. And it comes out of World War II radio operators. So actually trying to figure out how good radio operators were at identifying a real tar target versus a fake target. So is that an airplane or is that a flock of seagulls or maybe just one seagull uh, that's giving a, 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 a kind of a false positive uh, result uh, when you're looking at a, a radar. And so what you get when you do ROC analysis is you basically, you have to know what your sample set is that you're using. You have to have a gold standard method for saying these are positives, these are negatives. Just like if, you, if you're aware of um, different machine learning uh, approaches to doing this type of thing, you have to have a well curated uh, and documented sample set to be able to initially train uh, the machine learning algorithm. Here, we're doing this with establishing cutoff values. So you, you build these curves that basically are showing the rate of true positives versus the rate of false positives. And you do that with your data sets. And then what usually happens in the statistics software is you can establish what is a cutoff value that allows you to maximize your true positive rate without, uh, without, and then making sure that you actually have very few false positives, um, but re retaining sensitivity. So you want to be able to measure as many positives that are really positive, um, but make sure that you don't have any uh, cross reactivity or, or true or negative results that are um, showing through as positives. So again, sort of a boring data slide, but we did this for both serum and dry blood spots. 
and you can start calculating these thresholding rate uh, numbers that you use to, to calibrate your assay. So we did that, uh, worked quite well. Uh, and so we were able to use that then as a sort of a, a thresholding background to look at any future samples that we used. So the other questions we had about when we were developing this test is, you know, what else can we use it for? Is it sensitive to uh, different concentrations of antibodies? So could you use it to do an antibody titer? And if you're not aware of what a titer is, right, you, what you want to do is to basically uh, dilute your sample until you can't measure a, a, a signal anymore. And that tells you a threshold for, you know, basically how much antibody you have in a sample or how much target you have in a sample. Uh, so in this case, um, we did a head-to-head -head comparison of our test uh, versus the standard approach that you would use to get an antibody titer, which would be an ELISA. And so what we found is ELISA was just slightly better at it's the minimum level that it could detect. So the, the most dilute sample that it could detect. detect. Um, but our approach was sort of interesting because we got this completely linear response. So when we build this antibody titer curve, we're completely linear with over a really large dynamic range. So what happens with an ELISA is um, you can often saturate. It's an amplification assay because it uses an enzyme to, to get the, the color production for the, the, the actual ELISA test. So you get these, these curves that look like a, kind of a saturation curve, which you see on the right. With uh, the chip-based approach, we're labeling with kind of a one-to-one -one match. Every antibody that binds gets labeled with one or maybe two um, uh, fluorescently labeled secondary antibodies. So we get this really nice linear response over a large dynamic range, which gives this approach potential for being a, a very um, reproducible and precise uh, way of doing a, a titer. So kind of a cool aside for, for how we might use the, uh, the platform. Okay, the other thing we wanted to know is we were, we were doing most of this work from the beginning looking at uh, immunoglobulin G. So IgG is the target. And so we said, well, what other isotypes um, can, we, can we look for using the same assay? And it should be pretty easy. Our labeling antibody is specific to the particular class of antibodies. So for all of the work I was just showing you, our secondary antibody, the one that has the, the fluorescent molecule, is targeting IgG. So you said, well, what happens if we have different secondary antibodies? So we did that for IgG, IgM, uh, and IgA and show that we get really nice uh, detection of all three types of antibodies. Uh, this is all with serum samples. We've done some anecdotal work and I didn't put slides up where we've also looked um, for and, and seen a much higher IgA signal uh, in, in uh, saliva samples that we've collected, which would be expected. Uh, we haven't tried it yet with IgE and based on some of the presentations from yesterday, I'm actually kind of interested to go back to that work to see if we pick up an IgE signal, uh, especially for the uh, post-treatment line syndrome is, is maybe a potential way to, to utilize this as well. So what I think is the, the coolest thing that we were able to do with COVID and, and, uh, and maybe has some implications for what we might do in the future with Lyme is that we were able to uh, look at patients uh, post-vaccination. And we did this for this in this particular uh, data set here was uh, people who had never been exposed to COVID, but had gone through a series of, of vaccination, whether it was uh, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so what we could show is that um, everyone who had actually gotten, I think this is, these are only showing Pfizer data on the left. Uh, so everyone who had, um, you know, at their both their, their, after their second dose, and then a few weeks after their second dose, um, we were able to measure a, a measurable antibody signal uh, against spike protein. Uh, but then you can see the circle down there on the bottom is that we do not see any response to nucleocapsid. Anybody know why? Because you're not vaccinating for it, right? So you're only vaccinating against spike protein. So it's sort of a nice internal control for our test. We should only be seeing response to spike protein uh, if, if someone's been vaccinated and not exposed to the virus. If they've, if they've actually been exposed and infected, we might expect to see antibodies against both nucleocapsid and spike protein. But because the vaccine's only against spike, uh, we only saw a, a spike response. The, the cooler thing that I think we did was we used the test to track uh, production of antibodies in a single patient uh, throughout their vaccination sequence. So the graph on the right is showing uh, pre-vaccination, uh, just after the first dose, just before the second dose, just after the second dose on sort of an hourly time course, uh, we had a very eager participant who kept like to stick his finger with uh, with, with lancets, I guess, uh, to collect these samples. Um, but it, we, we collected samples throughout all the way to two weeks post second dose. And what we're showing here is really kind of goes back to that 
comparison with ELISA for antibody titering, we're able to monitor for, let me see here, one, two, three, six, six or seven different target uh, antigens, what the antibody response is over time and have a relative magnitude of concentration of those antibodies uh, in the blood sample. So again, sort of an interesting application of the technology that we can be monitoring, um, you know, all these different targets and looking for that, um, that immune response uh, across a, a timeline. And the last thing we did that on COVID, but it's it, again, something that is potentially useful for future work in Lyme and tick-borne diseases is we wanted to see if we could not only measure antibody targets, but also measure uh, the actual pathogen itself in this case, you know, could we measure uh, viral particles uh, or components of the virus in a sample uh, in sort of a dual mode assay? And so I won't go into details of this paper, but long story short, all the convoluted looking stuff on the left hand is just saying we could print uh, antigen targets as well as antibody based capture agents onto the same chip and do a test that gives us a readout of detecting both uh, the presence of antibodies from either infection or from vaccination at the same time that we're measuring pieces of the virus. So if you think about this from the perspective of, of what type of diseases you're looking for, and for tick-borne illness, there might be a case to be made for wanting, uh, in some cases, to look for the serological response, uh, but at the same time wanting to directly look for pathogen in the sample uh, or another biomarker, for instance, uh, at the same time. And so this just shows that we can, we can do that multiplex type of assay looking for both uh, antibody and an antigen target. So, okay, so I said that, we're, this was, that was sort of the middle of the story. And so now I'll be filling you in on the, the two other bookends of what we did uh, from a Lyme perspective. So I think this is a boring slide for this audience. I think you all know the two-tier testing criteria that CDC recommends. Uh, but just just as a kind of a, a you know level set point for all of us that the, obviously there's a two tier testing method first tier looking either at um, usually whole cell sonicate response or C6 peptide as the target uh, for the first round ELISA or, or immunofluorescence assay um, and if that's positive following that with a Western blot either targeting IgG uh, later in disease or IgM if it's early on so. Everybody's good with that. I think that's not, I'm not really informing you of anything here. Um, what we did when we were first looking at this platform that I just described for Lyme diagnosis is um, we were working with a, another lab uh, out of the State Department of Health who at the time was expressing a lot of different uh, uh, Borrelia antigens uh, for a number of other studies. And they said, well, hey, we, we can express all these proteins for you. If you can print them onto your chips, we can see how well this works uh, for a, a long Lyme diagnostic assay, just a straight serology, see if we can compare it to Western blot. So that's exactly what we did. We, we worked with our group, uh, got all of these purified proteins, uh, spotted them onto chips, and then started looking at whether or not we could use that um, uh, to, to actually you know, met, met, do, make a diagnostic for Lyme. Uh, so just like the slides I showed you for uh, the COVID work, you know, we print these various antigens, we print a positive control, uh, which is human IgG. Uh, and then uh, at the time when we were first doing this Lyme, as I mentioned, we were using bovine serum albumin. We also used a bacteriophage, MS2, as another you know, potential negative control, just throwing anything at the wall to see how, how good of a, a set of negative controls we could have. And so then again, we do the sandwich style assay. So the, the, the black antibodies are the ones that would be from the patient, at least the one that landed on the antigen on the left. And then we use this secondary label to, to, to determine if that we had binding in that first event. And then obviously we wanna compare this to a Western blot to see if it has similar uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, so we, we published, the first paper we published on this was in 2020 in PLOS One. And so it really kind of took us through this whole process except that my student who, who helped made this figure at the bottom, um, we didn't actually do machine learning in this first paper. We did machine learning later. Uh, and I, I don't think I have a slide on that to show you for this. Uh, so here's what the arrays look like just as a map. So we have all these different antigens. If you're a, a Lyme or Borrelia geek in the audience, you'll recognize a lot of those, uh, those antigens. Uh, some of them overlap directly with what's on the Western blot. Some of them are unique uh, and we're just, you know, what we happen to be able to get from this, this partner lab uh, to be able to put on the chip. So this is what the chips look like. If you, this is a, a patient, uh, I think this was a Lyme arthritis sample that we had initially. And so we get this mosaic of different responses 
to the different targets. And so that's sort of like what you see with a Western blot. You're looking for X out of Y. So whether it's five out of 10 lines on the IgG Western versus two out of three. And I don't actually don't stay current. I hope I said the right numbers uh, for, the, for the IgM uh, Western blot. But we see the same type of thing here. We've got you know this whole slew of different antigen targets, and we're seeing a differential uh, binding of antibodies to uh, you know that range of different uh, targets uh, from one patient sample. So when we we did this, we had a whole bunch of samples that we collected from CDC, from State Department of Health. We purchased some from the Lyme disease biobank, uh, and threw all of those at these chips. Uh, and tried to figure out which one of which which subset of antigens were going to be most predictive of disease, uh, and so which ones should we then utilize later for actually doing diagnostics. And so this is maybe it's maybe a boring slide for us. It was a, a culmination of a lot of work to figure out you know how to actually make our algorithm. And at the time we were really thinking this would be a single tier algorithm. Could we forget about doing the two tier approach and could we just have a single tier algorithm that was you know very robust. So we, we first took all of our results and we did that, that ROC analysis that I told you about, that receiver operator characteristic. And there's, there's a way of looking at those data uh, and the quality of the, the ROC curves that you can eliminate uh, basically antigens or targets that don't give you a, a very good response at all in the ROC analysis. So this allowed us to, to eliminate seven uh, antigens out of our, our total panel. We could then you know, down select to our, our 10 targets and then come up with different combinations, just like you would with the, the Western blot approach. So if we picked these three antigens and used those as our targets, it could we say that if we had two out of those three positive, that that was a positive Lyme diagnosis, you know, and you could, you could do all of the different permutations here. So, so this is one of the, the figures from the, the paper that we published on it. Basically, we, we, the simplest case scenario was uh, the case where we had three target antigens uh, there's some uh, you know common players in, in all of these different scenarios, but uh, DBPB, DBP, DBPB came up uh, commonly. VLSC, which is where the C6 peptide comes from, uh, came up a lot, uh, and then a variety of other antigens. And so what we're able to say is like this with the simplest assay, if we just had two out of three of, of something from that first column, we could get 90% uh, sensitivity and 100% specificity out of that particular test. And so that's with a limited set of samples that we started from. So very good sensitivity and specificity with just a, a few targets. And so when we, we use those criteria to score our panel of, 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 um, of serum samples that we were working with, what we found interestingly was that we scored very well for all of the um, uh, both known positive and known negative samples, uh, especially for the, the later stage Lyme disease. What was cool, though, was that we were uh, doing a much better job predicting um, Lyme diagnosis for early Lyme disease. And we sort of attributed that to the fact that we've got this very sensitive detection method. Maybe we're picking up antibodies that just don't show up as well on the Western blot. So this is exciting, and it kind of led us to say, well, you know, how do we make this assay better and, and continue to improve it and start looking at larger sample sets to prove if this is really the case? Um, I'll say one more thing before that. People still were, were commenting to us that we really should be seeing if we could do both IgM and IgG detection on the same chip. So we did a little bit of work um, uh, to show that we could first score a chip for IgG response, which is more stringent. So actually label for IgG first, and then come in with a second label on the same chip and score for IgM as well. And so the, the data here show you that the light gray bars are the initial IgG scoring that we had for a particular sample. The, the red, and this is uh, dated because this is the time um, when we were, we were establishing you know, these unique cutoff values for each uh, one of the reagents. The red is the, the, the background or cutoff. And then the, the dark gray bars are the bars that increase when we labeled for IgM. So what it tells us is that for a subset of the targets, we're able to get a, a big differential response when we are looking for both IgM and IgG versus just IgG alone. So Long story short, it gives us this other tool to potentially have a, a more sensitive test for even earlier uh, stage, uh, and just knowing that we can we can in one test detect uh, both types of antibodies. So where are we now? So we've we've kind of taken what we've learned from COVID testing as far as what negative controls to use. Um, we've we've kind of imported a few other methods that we learned from uh, the, the COVID work. 
uh, and then started to make a, a newer round of, of Lyme diagnostic chips. And actually the, the data I'll show you next are not from this latest version. We've recently added C6 peptide, uh, which I mean, it's interesting for the geeks in the room who do a, a diagnostics. It, C6 is not something you can, at least that we found, just order off the shelf. We actually had to have that peptide synthesized, uh, you know, specially, and then add it to our chip after the fact. All of the other antigens we could just purchase off the shelf. And so that's really how we've tried to build the, the test now. So we have a well-validated, uh, you know, produced outside of our laboratory set of antigens that we can use to build the test. And then now uh, just recently added uh, what could be a first tier test within our overall test. Uh, and that's sort of the theme that we've seen with the modified two tier is that people actually, it's the same test, but you score it once for the first tier and then score it again for the second tier. So you technically have a first and second tier within a single experiment. So we, we've worked with a new sample set that we got in the last few years from the CDC. This is one of their sample sets they give to companies or laboratories that are coming up with a new diagnostic. And it's for us at the time, 82 samples seemed like a lot. I know for, you know, actually doing validation on a diagnostic, this is still a relatively small sample set. Um, but essentially what it gives you is uh, different stages of Lyme disease. Uh, it gives you some endemic and non-endemic negative controls and then a bunch of lookalike diseases that might have cross-reactivity with your test to be able to make sure that you're weeding those out and you're not scoring false positive on those samples. So I've already walked you through our process flow, but th these data we actually collected last summer and we're revalidating the entire data set now uh, that we've added that C6 peptide. Uh, so we will have results. I hope when I get back to the lab this afternoon, they actually have uh, the new results from the, the retesting of all of these. But long story short, what this busy graph shows or table shows you on the right is that as compared to just scan standard two-tier testing for this exact same sample set, so CDC provides you with all that scoring information, we had about a 10% increase in sensitivity using our method um, when we use this receiver operator characteristic uh, method to do thresholding. Um, and so that was overall sensitivity. And really where we're picking that up is in the early Lyme samples. So we're really picking up, as I showed you in the previous table, more of the early Lyme samples um, with this test versus the standard two tier, which is cool. Um, the other thing that we, we've done is we've started to use machine learning to analyze the sample, uh, the, the data. And so what this is showing us is that we might be able to make a more, an even more um, sensitive test um, if we look at the results from a machine learning standpoint. So basically what that does, instead of just saying, okay, I'm gonna score two out of these three or five particular antigens for being positive. It's actually looking at all the data at once and doing actually internally to the machine learning, some sort of, it's, it's sort of a regression analysis that it's running before it comes up with a scoring algorithm. So what we found with machine learning is that it, we actually get better sensitivity, but it, that does affect our specificity, which is not a great thing, right? If you're, if you're calling false positives uh, off of samples. So we, we think we need to test many more samples to really refine find that algorithm. So I'll leave you kind of where we are right, right this minute. We got a, a, a grant from the New York State um, uh, Biodefense Fund. So this is Empire State Development. If you're not aware, it does all these kind of funding of various economic development activities. Um, we were lucky and got funded in the first year uh, in conjunction with our industry partner, Ciencia, to really push this test more towards validation and hopefully commercialization at some point. So a lot of our work has been making the sort of ergonomics and ease of use of running one of these tests uh, much better. Uh, so that's that's work in my lab. We work with our industry partner, Ciencia, to make the consumable easier to work with. So we're, we're a bunch of nerds in the lab doing this, you know, me and my, my grad students. And we don't think much of having to deal with, you know, fluidic tubing and putting chips in and out and handling samples. But if you're going to make this an actual clinical test, it has to be really easy and user-friendly for, for someone to use. So we've been working on the consumable side of it and then so, uh, the uh, actually whole system itself to um, it being a, a well-engineered system to work with. So we can then hand it over to a secondary uh, laboratory for validation studies. Oops. So this is our, our team, some of my students and staff from the lab and then representatives from Ciencia who have they recently installed that new instrument in my lab to, so we're kind of like the, we're, we're not even a beta test site. We're like the alpha test site for being able to do this. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is, is make the whole format of the test a little easier. So the, the way it runs now is much more like something you'd see maybe in a clinical diagnostic laboratory. 
what we've been asking ourselves, is there a way that this could be maybe even a field portable type of device? Not that you need to necessarily test somebody in the field for Lyme, but uh, but for other other types of tests, you might want to do this in a kind of faster, easier method. So we've been taking those same chips that I showed you and making little dipsticks out of them. So we figured if people can squirt, uh, you know, oral swab or a nasal swab, uh, you know, onto a little lateral flow test like they do for COVID, they probably can swirl a little detection stick into a tube uh, and, and stick it in a reader. So we're, we're playing with approaches like that to see if this is a, a way to make the test even more user-friendly and adoptable and, and more of a field portable uh, setting. That's my team. I have to thank, we, we have funding from, uh, as I mentioned, the Biodefense Fund and NIH, uh, and then our, our partner on this is Ciencia. I think I broke a rule, there's a, there's a logo on here, so pretend you didn't see the logo from Ciencia. Uh, but anyway, thank you, and, and thanks to the folks at Department of Health and Ciencia for, for all the help with, with um, samples and then getting the, the work together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. I think the, did you did you do your Ranger Ready spray when you took that picture? Yeah. And did the, are the clothes all treated with permethrin? We we rolled around in the grass first, and just we were trying to pick up as much more as samples. We could. Yeah, more samples. I'm going to go to the front. I see the two questions in the front. I'll start with Dr. Brian. This, by the way, I got Mike coming your way. This, by the way, is the reason when I went to Cornell, I studied communications. <laughs> But if you want, I do. I have prepared a five-minute summary of his presentation later on. I'll, I'll, I'll print it out for you. Uh, Nate, Brian from SUNY SF, I'm, I'm happy to see this moving forward over the years um, from its inception, I think, I don't know, six, seven, eight, maybe eight years ago I saw it. Um, and I hope Eunice is doing well as well. So, yes, uh, <laughs> um, my question is, uh, and I'm thinking about it practically from how you do like a sandwich ELISA, these are very small spots, mm -hmm. um, and the initial antibody, the initial serum laying on the spot, um, is it the total chip, or do you have microfluidics pumping single samples onto little teeny tiny areas? So we we dilute uh, one to hundred, so that we're actually more dilute than a lot of the different uh, uh, assays out there. So we're diluting sample in a running buffer, and then it just runs across the top. Because it's a microfluidic chip, uh, you get much more total volume per area uh, interaction with that sample. So you don't get all of the fluid flow over every spot, but you're getting a, a much higher percentage of the total volume interacting with your spots, if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, and, and yeah. if I might just one more question. Yeah. Uh, what's the, how, how is the affinity, uh, how is the, 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 the strength of, of that bond um, compared to, to a, some, I don't know, a, an ELISA or something, I don't know. Yeah, so the, um, and I, we're down in the uh, like high picogram uh, limit of detection for this, so we're, it's it's very good affinity, good lower limit of detection. The this the actual antigen that we print on, uh, we don't even need a, any kind of covalent chemistry to link it to the surface. It dries on and then stays put, uh, and so it sort of depends on what antibody you're targeting as far as what affinity affinity you'd be seeing for that. So okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, hi, thank you. This was a really wonderful talk. This technology looks fantastic. Um, I think you kind of already answered this with uh, the issue with microfluidics, with it um, having it uniformly flow over the chip. How is your precision? The precision? Yeah, or like yeah. from chip to chip, where I saw, um, I think, with some of the Lyme samples that you had four dots per. Yep. Yeah, so for for all the antigens, we've played with a few different, so a, a few different things in that regard. So we... The, our min, absolute minimum is three spots per target. And so we have that averaging over the chip. We have our internal controls. And then that's that's one of the things we're doing now is the repeatability studies. So we've done a few repeatability studies more in the, the COVID testing that we did, um, you know, with, with running, you know, three or four samples, or sorry, three or four chips per sample with very good repeatability from chip to chip. And so one of the issues right now is we're still a research lab. And so the way we print chips, the way we make cartridges, the way we test, is all, you know, they're subject to the the error in between all of those those steps. And so we've been working for, we're working towards in this biodefense project is adding consistency to all of those. So we we improve that re reproducibility and even more. But as far as like actual scoring, we're we're 100 percent reproducible for the overall score for a sample. What we get is some variation, in the absolute intensity for spots. So. Right here. Hi, that was very exciting. Um, I'm th thinking in terms of feasibility and commercialization. Mm -hmm. So is this, uh, does Ciencia have 
uh, their machine and in, in across clinical labs with other uh, other tests or is this brand new? So th their business strategy has been to build research instruments for the most part. So they're in a variety of labs. Um, there's some partners at UConn who use this in a few different immunology research labs. So they have instruments around different different laboratories. That's part of what the goal of this biodefense grant is, is to actually zero in on the niche for the, the, the target audience, if you will, to, to utilize the instrument and then uh, decide whether is it really a research instrument or is it a clinical diagnostic? And if, if it's a clinical diagnostic, what's your user base? And so we're actually getting into some of those questions now is, you know, for the most part for, for Lyme, we're using a prepared serum sample. We know from the COVID work, we can do this from a dry blood spot. So, which is, you know, very little sample prep for that. So, you know, thinking about exactly what our final, you know, is this going to be a CLIA waved instrument? Is it a CLIA based? So I, I think that's, I can't answer your question completely, but those are the things we're thinking about. That'll help bring the cost down too. If yes. You have all that. Run again, Brian, just shout it out. I'll be up there. <laughs> yeah, what's the, what is the cost? I, I'm thinking like in, in areas like uh, in countries where point, like diagnostics do not exist. Yep. So what is the cost of it? Right now, I know. What would you think this is? So the instrument itself, so to, to build it, it's uh, it's under a thousand dollars to build it. So that's not not a bad cost for the actual reader instrument itself. The consumable, we're kind of working in the right now. It's probably if you were to make it today, uh, in the ten to twenty dollar range for making that chip. So that's again part of this project is to to drive down that production cost for for making the consumables uh, and. I think what we still have to figure out too is, is reagent wise with those consumables as well. It, it does require a labeling antibody, which that does get pricey, but um, there's ways of, of driving that down as well. So. From Zoom? Uh, no, from dear old me. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, again, I'm I'm Keith Wilson. I'm an MD MPH student here. And so a little bit selfishly, I kind of wonder, looking forward to my career, when could I see this technology, say in an urgent care or a mm -hmm. primary care setting? What's that half of the, how long out? Yeah, so we, we ought to ask FDA that question. So we, we, we filed a pre-sub uh, to FDA for 510K submission and uh, we just got good feedback from that in August. So I think it's, all the other two preceding questions are really the key questions right now is what, what's the final target audience and use case for this? And then uh, you know, production and, and producing consumables on the instruments. So on a fast track, it's a couple years out. Um, we'll see how fast that really is once we're doing this. So good question. A couple of years sounds pretty good, actually, sitting here today. Who else has a question for Dr. Katie? Oh, right up front. In the middle. So I, I think I saw on one of your slides that your detectability um, with no false positives mm -hmm. was 10% better than what's existing. Yep. And that, wasn't it? Yep. And, and the 10% was especially um, focused on the early detection. Yep. All right, which sounds great because that's what everybody's been hollering about was we need a better way to test for this so we can treat for it sooner. Yep. And it went up to 95, 96% when you use the machine learning, which yep. I don't understand what that means, but it sounds great with, with a concomitant um, amount of false positives. Yep. Um, is it possible to, to market something like that? It's like, okay, well, you might, you know, we'd, we'd get 30% more detection, early detection, with a a certain amount of false positives, but we can always start an initial treatment and and get the antibiotics or whatever, and then test you again in three months or or something, and say, well, you know, if you didn't have Lyme, no no harm, no foul. But if you did have Lyme, we've now uh, prevented potentially an additional thirty percent of of cases. That I sounds like a pretty good deal. I, I completely agree with where you're going with that. What we found with our first round of FDA Q&A is that, so that the first challenge is actually, we, we initially thought we could do this as a single tier assay. So just one algorithm and use that. What we found with the, the little back and forth with FDA is that 
really that's it's not a non-starter but it's a completely new device new method submission versus being able to do use a predicate device or predicate method to to do the comparison and get this to market faster so we found even just for a single tier versus two tier we really have to make this into a a two tier type of assay so then this this added question of whether you could say that there's some diagnostic probability of you know suggesting treatment I think that's where we 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 don't really know where we fit right now. Whether we can actually say something, you know, is that something you can label your device as, or is that um, you know should be left to interpretation by whoever's you know asking for the results? Uh, so I don't have a good answer. I think that's it's something we were thinking about at the same time, but uh, I'm not sure that's something we could actually label this as. Um, you know, to to suggest you, you sure treat because it's got a 90 percent uh, probability. I I think that. I think that it is marketable just based on the fact that there are non FDA approved research or not even research, non FDA approved Lyme tests that are out there that do have potentially higher sensitivity. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know one in particular that's doing remarkably well that's got like a 57% false positive rate, <laughs> which, you know, that's not great, but they're, they're making money and they're marketable. I think your product, if this continues and you can refine it further, would be awesome. And I was wondering when I could get one in my clinic. <laughs> if you want to be a test site, we'd love to have you. <laughs> uh, Nate, you'll, oh, did you submit machine learning to FDA? And I'm wondering, no. there's no, I don't, the machine learning hasn't been used in clinical diagnostics. I don't think as such, but if, if you use machine learning to develop the algorithm, but then you actually can open and show what that algorithm is. So we found that changes like, with the yeah. what data it's looking at though. Yeah. So we, we did machine learning across lots of different methods and it was a, it was actually a linear regression machine learning algorithm that was the most accurate algorithm. So I think if, if you could, if you could show what the algorithm algorithm was within that, then maybe you'd have a case for it. Good luck. Yeah. All right. Thank yeah. You. Again, I've summarized this for you. Let's give a hand to Dr. Katie. Um,